G'day guys, it's Rodney from I Comply, and on our second part of our three-part Christmas series, we're gonna go back and have a look at some of the great having yarn on the farm segments that we did with politicians this year. Now, I've been pretty lucky to interview quite a few politicians and uh, guys that gave their time gracefully and guys that uh, spoke from the heart about issues that farmers are facing. And uh, I wanna pay special mention to, uh, first and foremost, Minister David Littleproud. Um, David came on early on in the piece when I'd started having yarn on the farm. And uh, it was when the Ag Visa was, you know, in process of being announced and a lot of people were asking me um, what was happening with the Ag Visa. Well, I went straight to the source and uh, I spoke to Minister Littleproud. And at the time I was pretty lucky because he was uh, at home, home quarantining after coming back from Canberra, so there was a window of opportunity for me to do a yarn on the farm via Zoom with uh, Minister Littleproud, and he was absolutely fantastic in being very honest and forthright about issues farmers facing. I think that he is a great asset um, in government for farmers. He gets farming, he understands farming, and uh, you know, whilst the Ag Visa you know, is not implemented yet, it's announced, it's set in stone, it is gonna happen. Um, I've got no doubts that next year we'll see the Ag Visa starting to roll through. Um, other notable politicians that I've spoken to, um, which I want to thank, uh, James Lister, member for Southern Downs. Um, James has been very vocal down in uh, the Southern Downs area, in particular with regards to border closures because he represents a lot of constituents down there um, in the Southern Downs region that were affected by the border closures. Uh, I reached out to James um, at a time when we were having some issues with uh, a couple of people trying to get across the border, what could come across, what couldn't come across. The man is a, a workaholic and uh, when I rang him and said to him, look, I'd love to get you on the podcast, uh, we did that podcast at 6.30 in the morning um, because you know he was booked out for most of the day. but. He felt it was important for us to have a chat and I really appreciated the fact that uh, he met me out on a farm at 6.30 in the morning on a cold Stanthorpe morning to have a yarn to us and I was very appreciative of what uh, James Lister had to say and giving us time for our Having a Yarn on the Farm podcast. Uh, another notable politician, which was a great yarn, um, the member for Gympie, Tony Perrett. Uh, what a champion bloke. Tony's actually the... Shadow Minister for Agriculture as well, um, a very large cattle producer in his own right. And um, it was a great yarn having a chat to Tony about problems that the farmers are facing. Uh, and also, you know, having a little bit of a chat about the drought and the importance of water security uh, moving forward. An extremely knowledgeable man. And another man that I did the podcast at 6 a.m. because he was busy, but, um, you know, made time for us to have a chat and we did that podcast via Zoom at six o'clock in the morning um, with Tony and I was really appreciative for, for his time, uh, but more importantly, I was very impressed with his insights. Um, it's comforting to know that there's people in government um, with farming experience. And last but not least, um, a man that uh, I believe will be the next Premier and boy oh boy do I hope he's gonna be the next Premier and that is the current minister for op the opposition leader, uh, David Chrisofuli. Um, Dave came on and uh, how I met Dave was, um, I'd spoken to several people in his, um, in his party about problems uh, farmers were facing, farmers were talking to me and I was relaying them back to um, people in his areas. And he's got some great people in his cabinet, guys like Dale Last up at the Burdick and um, Andrew Powell at the Glass House, Deb Frecklington and Nango, uh, Tony Perrett in Gympie, James Lister down at Southern Downs, uh, all farming areas. And these guys get farming. And uh, these guys actually took some of my concerns to uh, their boss, who's the leader of the opposition, Dave Chrisofuli. And one day I got a phone call saying, g'day mate, my name's David Chrisofuli. And, uh, he gave me a lot of time to speak about the problems that farmers were facing and how we could help. And uh, when I reached out to him to jump on the podcast, um, you know, he made time in the middle of a sitting week at Parliament. Um, during his lunch break at Parliament, he 
rushed upstairs and uh, made time because he felt it was important to, to get his message out. We had a great chat about sugar um, and I actually learned a lot about the sugar industry which I knew nothing about. Um, so have a look, watch and enjoy um, part two of having a yarn on the farm Christmas recap where we look at some of the best bits of the politicians that I've interviewed over the last 12 months. Enjoy watching. Minister, the announcement of the proposed Ag Visa it was announced back in June and the growers were rejoicing. You know, they, after a rough trot due to border closures and shortage of labour, it was the first time they truly believed that someone was listening, someone was in their corner and their prayers were answered. Uh, however, we're now mid-August, some eight weeks later, and there's not much been reported about the proposal. Uh, whilst I understand Rome wasn't built in a day and these things take time, there's sheer desperation and despair out there regarding the crisis and farmers are pinning a lot of hope on this ag visa. So I guess the question I want to ask you first is, how's the ag visa progressing and uh, will it actually happen? Yes, it will. Uh, this has been an article of faith of both myself and the National Party for many years. When I became Ag Minister in 2017, this was something that I was committed to achieving and I had one false start and got rolled by some of my coalition colleagues a couple of years ago. But this time, as part of the UK Free Trade Agreement, the National Party said we will not sign up until we get an Ag visa. Uh, and can I say the Prime Minister is a man of his word and the finalisation of that, in fact, we will be looking to make an announcement of a start date probably within the next, even tomorrow or in the next coming days. Uh, the starting date of that, let me tell you, of what the Ag visa will, when it will commence, uh, will be uh, very, very uh, not long after that. Uh, so let me say we are talking about weeks, not months, not years for the, for the uh, starting of an Ag visa. We are talking about a matter of, of weeks now. Um, we've done a lot of legwork since we started um, and, and got this up on the 16th of June in making sure we get the mechanics right. And, and I mean, this has been consulted to death, Rodney, as we all know, industry knows what they wanted. We've listened. There is one little piece that, that needs to be finalised off once we make this announcement with industry, which is about how do the little guy, the little farmer get, gets hold of this as well and how do we get portability into it. And that's one of the key features that we'll, we'll finalise. But again, that's not a month job. That's a week or two's job in getting finalisation with industry, how we give comfort with that and protection to our farmers, uh, to our workers. But I can tell you, I'm very proud to say that this is imminent. It is a matter of weeks before we start. Uh, and the other, the other piece around this, you just got to understand is that there's some delicate conversations that need to happen uh, with other countries uh, through embassies and high commissions. Uh, and they will commence in the next 24, 48 hours. So we have to be respectful of that. And that's what we've been working through all the way in making sure we get all this right. We knew the urgency of it. Um, but let me say, it still doesn't stop you from bringing in those specific uh, workers that are, that are sitting over there now. But this will be skilled, semi-skilled and unskilled workers. We've had a tough time down here in Stanthorpe. Uh, I've had a couple of clients that uh, employed workers that were on the other side of the border. And when the Palaget government closed the borders, um, they were stuck over there and didn't have the workers come over. Um, it's been a tough time the last month with regard to border closures. Yeah, it has, Rodney. We've, um... When the border closes, um, people understand the necessity for that, but it's the way it's done that's important. And um, my concern all along over the last 18 months to two years has been, we need more border crossings so that those who are entitled to cross the border can do so, but don't have to travel too far. And we need exemption arrangements that reflect how our communities and how our economies really work. So as you said, there are uh, a workforce that doesn't recognise the border. Uh, they move to where the work is. Uh, and crops like this, this box all here at, at Gray Nance's place, um, it doesn't wait, it's got to be done and the labour needs to be there to do it. That labour is important to our local economy, it's important to producing the food that feeds us. I think one of the biggest misconceptions is there's borders and there's the borders. You can't compare the border at the Gold Coast with the border at Stanthorpe. They're chalk and cheese. Yeah, absolutely. The um, Gold Coast border is a highly populated one. You know, there's uh, probably a couple of million people between Coolangatta and Brisbane. Um, here in Southern Downs, at places like uh, Stanthorpe up in Killarney, uh, you know, Texas and, and Gundawindi, um, there are special um, industries there, some are grains, some are cattle, some are horticulture, uh, and there's a very small population on both sides, and movement across is necessary, especially when there's no COVID uh, in the areas with New South Wales that we need to move across for. It yep. is that dire out there with the labour crisis, and no matter which area you talk to, um, it's absolutely dire, and what what I guess all farmers are, are crying out for is 
And I love what the, the new opposition leader, David Chrisafuli, um, and I've been following him a lot. David comes out and says, you know, you can, you can be smart, but you can also have a heart. And, yes. you know, you can make decisions, but also have a little bit of common sense. Um, you know, I've been advocating for 12 months to try and get workers in from Vanuatu. And yep. in Vanuatu, there's been zero COVID cases. Yes. Okay? None, nada. So there's probably 500 workers sitting there now waiting to come to Australia. Yes. Now, the Chief Health Officer here in Queensland wouldn't allow us to bring in workers from Vanuatu, from a country with no COVID, because yep. they might bring in COVID. Yes. Okay, so yep. they might bring in COVID from a country that doesn't have COVID. Yes. I mean, as stupid as it sounds, this woman with multiple degrees got up and said, we can't bring them in because they might bring in COVID from a country that doesn't have COVID. Now, Jacinda Arden over in New Zealand, she listened to her farmers and she said, you know what? There's no COVID in Vanuatu. Bring them all in quarantine free. As many as we can tomorrow. Right? Yes. And they sent plane loads, plane loads, plane loads. Now, all those, now the borders are open, are opening and there's less quarantine. And, you know, we're in a position where, oh, well, we can now bring in those Vanuatu workers. Guess where they are, Tone? They're all in New yes. Zealand picking fruit. That's right. We've missed the boat. Yes. And the, the procrastination and the the hard-headedness and arrogance not to, not to listen to find problems it's costing us and costing us dear. I'll tell you, in the horticultural sector, the labour crisis isn't going to be solved for another 12 to 18 months. And even right now, you know, in New, in New South Wales, in Melbourne, in Adelaide, I mean, the, the leader over in Adelaide, the Premier over there, and I, don't, I don't know who he is, but there are a lot of growers in Adelaide. Mate, he's moved mountains to help farmers. He's yeah. listened to all the farmers and said, how can I help? And he's brought plane loads of seasonal workers in. He hasn't procrastinated. He hasn't put up roadblocks. He hasn't said, you've got to go quarantine here, there and everywhere. Um, he's just made stuff happen, which as a politician, that's what you've got to do. You've got to make stuff happen. Doesn't seem to be a lot of stuff happening with regards to farmers at the moment in the Queensland government. No, look, Rodney, you make an excellent point um, in and around that. And it's so frustrating because solutions can be found. You've got to, you've got to find a pathway to sort these things. Uh, and, and unfortunately, and, and I don't mind saying this, the Queensland government uh, haven't had that clear focus of, of wanting to deliver uh, for the farmers in this state. Um, the solutions have been there and you've articulated those particularly well. Uh, we've all known that, uh, but ultimately it was up to the Chief Health Officer and the government to pr provide that, that accreditation for them to come into the state, uh, and they should have done it. And, and Rodney, you'd know better than I, but I've been on farms and only just recently up in the Burdekin, where there's crops just rotting in the field because there's no one there to pick them. And, and I know earlier this year, and I know horticulturists made decisions not to plant crops based on the fact that there's no one to pick them. Now that, that should never be the case in a state like Queensland. Uh, but when you see those crops rotting on the ground, and I suspect even in my own electorate, and as you mentioned, you know, with that, the, the local farm with the garlic, um, that those crops simply won't be picked because if they haven't got those 30 workers there to do it when they need it, they're not gonna be, going to be picked or there's certain certain sections of those, those paddocks that just will, will be left to, to rot. When I did some work this morning and I did some research, um, it has been, you mentioned it's been tough on the sugarcane farmers with pricing, but one of the things I came up with was there's there's 1,800 sugarcane farmers now and, uh, you know, there used to be six or 7,000, so a lot of them have gone into other crops. I actually know I've got a couple of clients up in the burdock and that now grow rock melons that used to grow sugarcane, Italians. Um, one of the biggest things in horticulture at the moment is the little farmers are finding it tough because the supermarkets are, the margins are so big, small, that you've got to go bigger and bigger and bigger in order to survive. Um, are you seeing that in sugar as well? Is it getting tougher and tougher for the little bloke? Oh, completely. My, my dad's farm, once upon a time, even two generations ago, generation and a half ago, that would have supported 10 families. And these days it's dad and dad runs it with one man, one full-time man. And obviously they get people into plant and you've got a harvesting contract, which um, as I said, my brother-in-law runs that and does a bloody good job of it. Um, and dad's about half that contract, dad's farm. But yeah, no, no, the small farmer gets squeezed out. So to give you an indication, a size farm that, that I own, 
uh, say, call it 50 years ago, you would have made a real comfortable living on that. These days, uh, no word of a lie, it pays my rates, my insurance, and a little bit of money for the old man to run it. And uh, I'm not I'm not going out for dinner on the rest of it, I can assure you. So he said, you know, Rod, he said, how the hell are we going to get the next generation of farmers when all the ag colleges are closing? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, mate, ever since the Labor government come into power, they've closed Burdekin, they've closed Dalby, they've closed Longreach, they've closed Emerald. He said, if anyone wants to go out onto the farm now, where are they going to get the education? Um, Tony, is this a fact? Look, you're dead right, Rodney, uh, and it concerns me enormously just to see the, the, the next generation, the younger generation moving away uh, from farms. And look, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's not difficult to understand why they've been doing that. Um, if, if, if farms aren't profitable, then of course you're not going to get the younger generation that have that interest. And then, then you've got to link the training into that. And we've seen in recent times uh, the closure of the Emerald and Agricultural Training College and also Longreach, Partial College. Um, so there's no agricultural training colleges left. Uh, and, 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 and that disappoints me to think that you've got a government At that the time won't... we're such a big primary producer, yeah. how does that happen? Look, I, 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 look, Rodney, only the minister can explain. He was the one that commissioned the report to close these colleges. Uh, and I've said plenty about that in the parliament. I don't understand why they don't. And not only that, Rodney, not only that, uh, and, and I do know this, uh, the, the state government used to support a program called um, School to Industry Partnership Programs, and they withdrew their funding to that program that was an industry-led uh, initiative um, only back three or four years ago that exposed high school students to a future in agriculture. And, and Rodney, we must start, um, not leave it till after school, we must start through edu you know, agricultural education programs and courses within high schools to, to present an opportunity for young people to go into agriculture. But Rodney, this government, and, and you're dead right, over the last 30 years, and it's not this current government, but Labor governments have successively closed these colleges uh, and, and it's to the detriment of the future of agriculture here in the state. The simple fact of the matter is, the Aussies don't want to do the work, do they, Dave? No, and we've got to be honest. I yeah. mean, um, there's been a structural change in society. I mean, when I grew up, my mum wouldn't let me stay at home in school holidays. I was out picking potatoes or rock melons and chinchilla for our Fergie Roberts um, and graduated to being a cotton shipper because it, it paid more money. Mm. Uh, but but most of us were out there doing that work. Now, um, you know, they want to be baristas or work in pubs and, you know, in the hospitality industry and they're not interested in doing that work. And that's... That's been a challenge for us to get um, everyone in the coalition to understand that Australians simply are not going to do this work. No. Um, and that uh, you don't have, the farmers don't have the luxury of sitting around and waiting for someone to turn up. When it's ripe, it needs to get from your paddock to their plate. Um, and if someone's not there, then it doesn't happen. And ultimately, they'll pay the price for it anyway. But our farmers need that surety of supply. So um, they're not going to do it. And, and that's, the, that's the honest truth of it. It's a sad indictment on society. Um, but you know, you you got to also understand that two thirds of those that are on Job Seeker um, are off it within 12 months. So there's a there's a cohort of Australians we can't get to have a crack at this, and that's that's just that's probably looking more generational. The next generation yeah. trying to change, um, and, and we've got to be honest. I mean, you can't you can't sugarcoat these things. No, but because these are real real problems that you, the farmer, are, are facing every day. Ultimately, um, the premier can devolve or, or, or uh, hand down tasks and delegate decisions, but she can't delegate the responsibility. She's responsible. Uh, and uh, I noticed that when things aren't going well, she doesn't do a press conference that day. Or no, she no. Show her face, you know, and uh, uh, I think people are entitled to say to themselves, how come that strictly essential uh, technician who was going to do essential maintenance on um, a capital equipment, which provides jobs and income for this district, how that what, and how he couldn't get a supporter. I was talking to a fellow um, who was stuck at the border. I had to talk him down from committing suicide uh, and until the police could get there because he'd been delayed um, for so long in getting decision on whether he could uh, travel to Queensland for some very essential purposes. So, um, you know, uh, we just need more emphasis on making decisions, making good decisions, and less on having a big media unit to craft the message every Correct. day. Correct. So uh, the I media mean, can capitalise on the disaster. My mate rang me up and he said, look, Rod, he said, what do I do? How do I get this guy across the border? I said, put him in a footy jersey. I said, put him in a footy jersey, give him a football, because if you're a footy player or a footy player's wife, you get brought straight in. And no, nobody um, could be, you can forgive anybody, 
for a point to that just being a, a, a grossly inappropriate um, you know, exemption and a grossly inappropriate action. The government has um, looked at that and, and, uh, uh, and pushed it through while we've got uh, good people who have a far more genuine need to get across the border to always. And that's the biggest issue. And that's, can I tell you something, James, talking bluntly, that's what pisses people off. I, I talked to a lot of farmers, Dave, and uh, when you were appointed as the leader of the opposition, a lot of farmers were excited because they said, we've finally got the son of a farmer, you know, that understands farming. And if you ask any farmer in, in Queensland right now, and I, I talk to farmers every single day, not just on my podcast, it's my job um, to liaise with farmers. They firmly believe there's severely, there's a massive issue with no one having a seat at the table that has a farming background. Um, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of speaking to Tony Perrett, who's the Shadow Minister for Agriculture, who is a, um, who is a farmer, he gets farming. You're the son of a cane farmer, you get farming. Um, there's not too many people on the other side of the fence that have driven a Polaris, driven a Massey Ferguson, um, or picked a peach tree. Um, that's a concern for farmers. It should be. Um, what's even more concerning is there's not enough people on the other side who've been in any form of business. You've got people who've uh, lived their life without having to know what it's like to pay wages and know what it's like to deal with cash flow issues. Uh, and we're lesser as a parliament for that case. A lot of our farmers will say to me that they believe that the farmers are getting ignored at the moment by the state government, that the state government is, you know, focusing on other areas and the farmers are getting ignored. I mean, I know yourself, because you've been thrown out of parliament, you're probably, <laughs> you're a prolific advocate for the farmer and you don't take a backward step. How do we get the state government to listen to the problems that we've got right now? Because you ask any farmer, they say the state government's just not listening. Well, look, you're, you're a good start, Rodney. I mean, these uh, the, um, videos that you do, you've got a growing audience of people who are becoming aware of the challenges that we face. And uh, it's all about numbers. You know, if we can um, get the message out there that our communities need the government to listen and need to make decisions that enable us to have our, our workforce without necessarily uh, impacting how we're dealing with COVID and keeping it, you know, on that side of the border, um, that, that's what we need. So uh, I think uh, the government is very political, you know, they go where they think the votes are. And uh, I think because they've won the last election and picked up seats because Anastasia kept the, the fear, safe. The fear campaign. Yeah, yeah. that those, um, uh, it doesn't mean they, they should stop listening to us. Um, but I think um, to a large extent they have. I, there just isn't that um, that uh, primary industries knowledge and focus at the camper table. Uh, you know, I, I just think we need to have guys like Pat Weir, you know, um, like, um, you know, we've got um, our, our Shadow Agriculture Minister is actually a, a, a beef producer, you know. Yeah, so he knows uh, so, farming, he yeah, knows, yeah, the, the, and that's the difference. Yeah, um, so uh, there needs to be a focus for everyone in the state, not just to service to that. Uh, and we do employ a lot of people who contribute a lot of money to the economy and a lot of livelihoods in the communities that I represent depend upon this, so it is real. Rodney, similar stories. And uh, my grandfather walked across Europe himself, um, exactly the same same thing after the war. Um, and our Ingham had a different Ingham variety and that was a town called Ingham. So when he migrated to Australia, didn't speak a word and didn't know anything about sugar. You imagine coming from Italy into the searing bloody well heat of North Queensland, cutting a, a type of crop that you've never heard of, covered in hairy marys, people dying of Vale's disease, which was from the rat, the rat piss in the cane. Um, it was hot, it was hard. They lived in barracks, mate. You, you imagine living in a tin shed in North Queensland, the sun smashing down on you, but they worked. They worked seven days a week and they were paid well because uh, it was work that no one else wanted to do and um, they saved their money and like I said, little little start that he just bought a little farm and kept on going and mate, when he died um, and you know, it was very sad to, to see him pass at an end of an era, um, but he, his English was so limited, but he didn't speak much at all full stop. He was just a humble bloke. He was just the most peaceful, hardworking, um, decent bloke you'll ever meet and he came to Australia for one reason, and that was to give his family an opportunity. And, um, you know, within two generations, one of them had got an education. Um, that was me. 
Um, my, I only have one sibling, it's a sister. My sister's the most incredible small business person you'll meet. She's got you know, a fleet of little shops that she, she runs there in town and her husband runs the harvester on the farm, so they're just great people. So he, he, he's achieved everything that he wanted. Within two generations, he, you know, he had a family that, um, you know, my dad set himself up very well and his kids have both gone on with a good work ethic. Okay, one of them's a politician, but you can't win them all, I guess. As you're aware, I do a lot of work in the strawberry industry in the Sunshine Coast. Uh, right now, at the moment, farmers are fighting two wars. Uh, the first is obviously the labour shortage and the war on labour. Uh, however, the last couple of weeks due to COVID and lockdowns, our largest market in New South Wales being non non-existent, we're actually facing a demand crisis as well with strawberries now plummeting towards 30% below production costs. Um, the growers this week need to place their plant orders for next season, okay, this week. Now, when they place their plant orders, they've got to put down a 40% non-refundable deposit for those plants. So I'm going to ask you, Minister, if you're a strawberry grower, would you place your plant order with confidence, knowing that not only the Agit visa will be advanced by April next year, but the workers would be able to come in, or would you take a conservative approach and order with apprehension? Yeah, and that's a great question, Rodney. And, and as an old bank manager, and I know Wally Sweet wouldn't mind me saying. <laughs> Wally sweating on these orders. <laughs> I, I, I used to sweat with him as his bank manager, so I know what it's like in the strawberry industry in particular, and, and those strawberry runners waiting for those orders to come in. Uh, so there are roles and responsibilities for each chair of government on this. I can assure you that the Ag visa will be up and going well before uh, April next year. Uh, uh, in fact, that announcement will be, as I said, um, the start date is not uh, months away, it is in fact weeks away. Um, so I, I think that's important for, for us and, and everyone to appreciate that there will be confidence in that. Um, so we, we, we've made a commitment to, to make sure that we can, we can achieve that uh, and that's also through diplomatic means and getting other countries to sign up. Notwithstanding that there are still 25,000 men and women from 10 Pacific nations ready to come in. Oh, yeah. and in fact, we opened up in-country quarantining um, this month for Vanuatu, which South Australia has taken up. Um, unfortunately, no other state will. So there is supply. Um, I've got to tell you, the biggest constraint now will be the quarantining. So um, what, what happened when COVID hit is that the premiers and chief health officers in each state said they wanted to own um, quarantining of people coming into this country, not just Australians coming back, but also agricultural workers. And they reaffirmed that on the 11th of December at the last national cabinet on this issue. Uh, so they have, they have the right of veto to bring people in. So we've been encouraging them to look for solutions, uh, whether that be not just on farm quarantining, that actually look um, there's been Aspen Medical um, and others that have put proposals to premiers whereby they would do the quarantine in addition to the state's caps. Mm -hmm. um, and no state has taken that up. In Northern Territory, we've worked with the Northern Territory Government and let them use one of the Commonwealth facilities there. Um, we have no problems with that. But the state's chief health officers are the ones that have the overriding power in this and the premiers. And so we've been encouraging them to come up with the solutions about how do we bring in large scale numbers to, to, to address this. Um, all, so all we're saying to the states now is we found the supply, we found 25,000 men and women in, in the Pacific. Now we're gonna find a whole lot other through the Ag visa. We are prepared to stamp the visas and the condition of, of that agreement at National Cabinet was that the premiers and chief health officers simply had to write to the prime minister and say, this is how we'll bring them in. And our chief health officer is happy with the quarantining arrangements. They will sign off on it. If they sent that, that letter to the prime minister with the method in which they were gonna do it, the prime minister would stamp the visas. That is what national cabinet agreed on the 11th of December. That is the process that probably South Australia is the only one that's really met much of the demand that they needed for, for workers and, and met the supply with bringing people in through a facility and also in country quarantining. So this, this will be the next constraint. And I just got to say our next pressure point, we've got this ag visa and I'm bloody proud of it, but the biggest letdown is going to be if I can't get the states, chief health officers and premiers to understand they now hold the pen in writing to us and saying, we'll bring them in and this is how we're going to bring them in. We own, we want to own it. Well, you want to own it, now do something about it. And that's the problem. The Aussies just, don't, we can sugarcoat it. We can say, hey, this year with the labour crisis, don't you think that all the farmers have tried to train Aussies? 
Okay, it's failed and it's failed miserably because they don't want to do the work. Plain and simple, yeah. Dave, they don't want to do it. Uh, and, and that is, that's that's exactly where society is and it's just important that the unions actually actually understand that. Rather, I, 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 there's a place for unions, I get that, and I get their philosophical bent, but you can't let philo philosophy philosophy, sorry, get in the road of practical reality. And that's what they're doing, is they're letting that get in the road of practical reality of people not wanting to do this work and farmers um, not making um, the opportunity investment decisions that they need to because they can't have a reliable source of labour. Mate, you talk about your uh, get to the gym because you're sitting um, down every day. I saw a Facebook post of yours today when you were at school. One of your school teachers had been had retired today and uh, I couldn't believe that you were A, the tallest person in the back row, but B, you obviously loved your mother's pasta because you were a little <laughs> bit tubby back then as a kid. <laughs> uh, well, I grew I grew early, but in fairness, everyone in my school had an Italian surname, so we're all our height. You're, you're, I think you're about the same height as me, so no, none of those short jokes here, so that's the first <laughs> one. But, Secondly, I was I was pretty chubby all the way through school. E even at uni, I sort of carried a bit of weight. It, it wasn't until I realised that I can't eat pasta every day and I can't eat bread every day. And look, I don't want to say this because chances are Dad will find it, but I've reduced the amount of sugar I eat as well. Yes, da hang on. Well, Dad, if you're listening, I still <laughs> go to the cafe. I still open them. And when the waiter's not looking, I tip them in. Just to make sure you're supporting the industry. I've of got course, love of course. <laughs> uh, throw a couple down the sink, make sure the farmers are okay. But I have reduced the sugar intake a little bit over the years and I find that works not too bad. <laughs> well, there it is, some great yarns with some great politicians that understand and get farming. And uh, I want to pay special mention and thanks to those guys, uh, Minister David Littleproud, David Chrisopouli, uh, James Lister, and Tony Perrett that gave their time gracefully and uh, had a chat about issues facing farmers. Get behind these guys and uh, like I've said before, if you like what I have to say, please like, share and subscribe. Share this podcast out. Let's get the message out there. There is the only way we're going to fix the problems that we've got in horticulture is to raise awareness. And the only way we raise awareness is to get our message out. Um, I want to thank those politicians, great guys who gave their time gracefully. And to all of you, have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you.